Welcome everyone to a special session of Voices with Raveki. I'm joined by two of my good friends and people who are often my, my partners in our platonic crimes, uh, uh, Christopher Mastipietro and Guy Senstock. And uh, we're gonna be doing another uh, uh, Dialectic into Dialogos workshop in July. We'll put some of the information in the notes, but uh, this is a standalone thing we're gonna do because this is part of a larger project. And some of you know, I've been really exploring this with Daniel Zaruba and Johannes Niederhauser. I did one with, uh, with Robert Gray and Eric, oh, I forget Eric's name, it was, but it was on uh, Robert's uh, channel, The Meditating Philosopher. Um, I did uh, one on the podcast with uh, Jack-O-Lantern. So I'm, I'm talking to everybody who will listen <laughs> or at least pretend to listen uh, because I'm very intrigued about this. I talked about it with John Rusin um, and about this bringing back together something that seemed to be separated in, by the later Heidegger, but very present in the earlier Heidegger, as Rakowski argues. I want to bring back a, a, a very rich transformative ph phenomenology and platonic uh, uh, accounts of intelligibility and reality. Uh, so as I say, to create, a, to create a living and lived Neoplatonism um, that is informed by post-nominalism, by phenomenology and science, et cetera. Um, it's, a, it's a daunting task uh, and um, um, I, I need all the help I can get. And uh, here's two gentlemen who are very good at helping uh, me. So uh, it was a long preambling introduction, but welcome, uh, Chris and Guy. Thanks, John. Thank you. Sweet. I just want to make sure we announced uh, July 9th and 10th, we have the next Dialogos and it's circling multi-layered um, practice course that will, the three of us will be teaching. So uh, all that information, uh, John will put in the show notes. That's right. But we'll be kind of in, in some sense where our attempt is to enact the very thing that we're gonna be um, teaching the basics of in that course. So if you're interested in that, check out the link and sign on up. The people that come to it are just extraordinary. I love them. Um, I'm having such a good time. I'm doing it like I'm practicing every week and having seeing all kinds of interesting things happening in inside of me and outside of me through it. And so I am so, so fascinated by this whole process. So this idea and looking forward to this conversation with the three of us, because the idea of I think what, well, one of the ways I love something I notice is I, I want to know everything about it. I want to know that there's a, I guess it's the, the erotic component of just wanting to consume and be consumed by it in some sense, right? Um, and there's something about what Dialogos what Plato was getting at, Socrates was getting at, the pre-Socratics were getting at, the, the, the sense of the logos that is so draws me in and makes me think about it constantly. Um, I know I haunt you guys with my, my three in the morning, like philosophical questions. <laughs> right? <laughs> but there's something about this is just keeps, it draws out thought um, and, and I'm, I just want to get closer to it. Yeah. And it, today I'd love just to get really, kind of really do some, do our diligence in terms of um, really laying out the, the, like the questions that we're going to be asking in this series. Like what, what are the questions, like what are the, what are the fundamental questions that we're facing and, and trying to and try, try to articulate them and get really grounded in what we, what we want to look at so we can on that basis just really get an optimal grip on our thinking or thinking together in the future, <laughs> future one so so, so uh, um in response to that um i've been deeply influenced by third wave what's called third wave platonism um this is the scholarship of platonism not something in the history of platonism uh, by you know typified by people like Highland and Gonzalez and 
also by Schindler, uh, of going back and paying a very close attention to the role of the non-propositional in Plato's theory, uh, which means that most existing theories of the forms tend to be conceptual propositional in nature. And it struck me that if Plato was on fundamentally about the non-propositional, it's odd that we would be looking for purely conceptual propositional accounts of the forms. And this also doesn't sit well uh, with later Neoplatonic readings of, of the forms. Um, and it struck me that um, what Plato often does is give uh, you know, experiential metaphors. The word idos is the look of something, its aspect. Um, uh, he brings in perceptual movement <clears throat> metaphors that are very phenomenologically laden and their transformative impact in order to try and point to, he tries to do something like demonstrative reference and, and perceptually index the forms rather than give what we what we all what people seem to always want in Plato but never find which is well but where's the precise definition right uh, uh, and of course many people in the dialogues try to do that and fail which is also instructive so I'm interested in two aspects then I'm interested in which in which uh, you know Husserl had the eidetic reduction but um, Marlo Ponti seems to open it up. It doesn't sort of close uh, on a final thing. You get I, what I call eidetic eduction. It's constantly drawing out. It doesn't come to an end. But I've, I've been thinking about how to complement the notion of eduction with edification. Uh, and I'm trying to pick up on two different meanings of edification. One is to build a structure, um, but edification also means to proleptic. It helps to propel people into transformation. Uh, it, that was an edifying discourse is the kind of, and I'm trying to play on both meanings of the word edification there because it's not just simply that we're drawing out, but as I like to say, there's this through line and the through line has a, a, an integrity to it, a centrality to it, uh, but it's, it's more like Rusin says, it's more like a melody uh, than it's a definition or an essence. Just real quick, edification, you said two things. One was production, what, what was the other one? Well, Go edification ahead. is the generation of a structure. Yeah, okay. And then the other is the, like a proleptic function that it helps propel us into transformation. Jacob's ladder, as it were, right? It's sort yeah. of, you can, you can sort of collapse these together, right? You're building an edifice that reaches and you're climbing that edifice as you build it. Yes. Right. Because one of the things I was, I was unhappy with, well, I am not happy right now with just the notion of adduction is it was leading, it was leaving out that Plato um, finds, right, uh, a, a kind of, there's, there's an aspirational affinity that's going on. There's the anagogic process. So the disclosure of the forms is not just a passive spectacle that we observe, but it is one in which we are inherently being transformed and we are being conformed to a structure that, uh, right, that we are participating in. So I'm sorry, I'm really struggling with the language, but do you understand there was a dimension missing in understanding it just as eidetic deduction? Mm -hmm. So I'm concerned with, I mean, there's three yeah. sort of contenders for what IDOS is. One is one part of Aristotle, Aristotle has multiple parts, where it's something like an essence, and then that was later understood as a set of necessary and sufficient conditions. And I think that that does not, that, so that's almost completely in the conceptual propositional mode that I want to put aside, right? Yep. Then there is something that is properly in the phenomenological disclosure side, which is what I, I, I've termed in the past, the structural functional organization, uh, the Gestalt, uh, Zawicki talks about this and talks about Plato, right? Not really having a theory of the Gestalts because you can't really do that. And there's something right about that. There's something right about the idea. Sorry, I got to talk for a bit to set up the problem. Right? Yeah, please, yeah. 
This is not a problem like go to go to the left and go to the right. This is like, how do we save our marriage? It's that kind of problem, right? Um, which, which, it, it's complex and requires transformation. Um, We're building right the step that we just took, right? It's actually okay. kind of the same problem when you think about yeah. it to how do we save our marriage? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, 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 yes. And I hadn't thought about that. Uh, so part of it is, right, this idea of a structural functional organization, what Spinoza would later call the Canadas. There's an inherent way in which something is self-organizing so that it behaves as a functional whole. The problem with that, the inadequacy see, I now see to that, so I'm doing some self-criticism here. There's something right about that, but the problem with, with that, and even already structural functional organization isn't the same thing as shape, right? It's more like the formula of a thing. But the problem with that is it's static. It, it, it tends to collapse it into like the, the multi aspectuality of a thing is not being properly dis displayed or emphasized by the notion of a structural functional organization, All right? Yes. So there's something important there, something to not be lost, but it's not something that is sufficient anymore. Instead, I've got, we've been talking about this other thing and working it out with people like Daniel Zaruba, and you've been working it out with Daniel, uh, uh, a guy, and right, and, and like the, this idea of the through line, the mel mel melodic through line. So all we, we actually never ac ever see any object in completion. We actually only see right. It, it has an indefinitely large number of aspects, but the, the aspects mm -hmm. do not do, do not present themselves as a cacophony. They present themselves as a melody. Each aspect somehow scaffolds the intelligibility of the next aspect, right? Like a melody. The notes aren't repetitive. They're not the same note. And there can be even sort of surprise and novelty, but the novelty always makes sense of the past and makes sense in terms of the past, okay. right? And the, the idea is the form is this through line in the inexhaustible intelligibility. Yeah. Okay. But the thing is, here, right it's not yeah, just yeah. multi aspectuality it's and this is of course the point of the logos it's it's multi perspectival it's not that it's not only that each thing has a through line that is never perceived right and th this is the thing we have to remember the through line is not itself an aspect it is not a thing it is not any aspect it is that which binds all aspects together but not but is not itself an aspect right yeah so there, there's that. And then, of course, it's multi-perspectival. And this is the great point of the Platonic dialogues, right? This perspectival disclosure of things is also non-propositional. And it, makes the, it, it, it gives extra dimensionality to the through line. It's not just the through line for this person. It's a through line for that. And somehow all the through lines have a through line. It's a meta through line. Uh, which is getting clumsy, but you know what I'm trying to. And then, uh, in reading with Dan Chiappi, Ux Cole's book, the book that had such a huge influence on Marlo Ponti and Heidegger, the, the psychologist that Heidegger cites the most, right? A foray into the worlds of animals and humans and a theory of meaning. Because Ux Cole talks about the fact that there isn't, there isn't one environment, right? So he introduces, and this is the only way I can put it, a trans-specific phenomenology. He says, okay, so you've got this flower and it means this to the, the girl who's picking it uh, for a decoration and a bouquet. It, it's a road for an ant, right? It's a drilling place for the cicada, right? And it's, it's food for the cow. And he says, look, right? Some features go, Come more foregrounded for this organism and other ones are backgrounded. So there's also this foregrounding and backgrounding, right, that is cutting across species. But it's not like it's not like there's like there's somehow they're, they're all different aspects of this same. Hmm, you know, I'm now at a loss for a word. He wants to say it's not an object for obvious reasons, right? So this is where I bring in the imaginal, and this is where, and a Plato, right, and this, and this is to give a deep and important, a even central role to mythology within Plato, 
because of the mythology is trying to do this kind of imaginal extension to take us into you know other environments and other beings the gods and whatnot in order to try and do something like what books cold is doing by getting us to see what the flies world is and the cows world is and the dogs world is right how do you say the, how do you say the name of that author books cold u e x k umlaut u l l Jacob von Uxkull, huge influence on 4E cognitive science. The notion of the Umwelt. The book is a foray foray into the world of animals and humans, a theory of meaning. So this, he introduced the term of an Umwelt, right? Uh, Organisms and environments form this Umwelt. He's a precursor to, uh, to Gibson in some way too, right? And so now when you, when you, when you do this imaginal extension Right, and you do now trans-specific dialogue and eidetic deduction. Your sense of the multi-dimensionality, right, like of the through line, now becomes almost overwhelming. Yet it is somehow bound up with the structural, functional organization of the thing because all of the properties somehow behave as a causal whole, even though all the properties are not being aspectualized, are not being sort of foregrounded by the fly or the cow or by John or by, right? Do you see it? And so it's like, ugh, like, and so, and then people might be saying, well, why does any of this matter to me, right? Like, why should I care about it? Because one of the things we are trying to do in the workshop is, return people to a proper reverential right relationship to being to things like honesty and courage and what what people often discover is exactly this property right there that courage is multi-aspectual it's multi-perspectival and there's something trans even trans specific around it because you can talk about the courage of a dog you can talk is that appropriate right you can even talk about different historical or mythological beings and their relationship to courage people will invoke frodo to talk about courage it's like frodo is a hobbit what the heck like what are you doing there right that's like oak school that's an imaginal extension and so right it sounds tremendously abstract but what i'm trying to get at and asking for help is i'm actually trying to get at what you're doing moment by moment and right and what you're not doing and what is what both what you're doing moment by moment when you're making sense and what's also available to you transformatively available to you aspirationally available to you moment by moment and this is a way of bringing the, the, the heights and depths of our ontology into the guts of our experience so that we can fall in love with being once again. There, I'll stop my speech, but that's the problem. That's the problem I'm wrestling with. I'm trying to get, you've got the structural functional, we're putting aside the definition. We got the structural functional organization. We have the melodic through line, but it starts to open up in, right, in, dimensionality when we do move to multiple perspectives and then it opens up beyond that when we move to imaginal extension yes yeah and then the you say and the question the right question, you're how they wanting all, to ask for the how do they all come together well so i have a preliminary idea mm-hmm. which is right because i'm trying to map it onto the best account i've worked out of what you know, making sense is relevance for life. But this the sort of the, the structure of the structural functional organization is a limiting, it's a selective constraint, right? Yeah. Uh, and then and then all of this multidimensionality, even in, in uh, um, even in imaginal extension, this is the variation. But what we're doing is we're constantly moving between these. We're constantly moving between these. And so I don't quite understand how. So the question is, how do they fit together? Is that the right proposal? Is is it something like that? That you know, the the melody can never violate the fundamental integrity of the structural functional organization, but the structural functional organization can never close down or stop the unfolding of the melody. There's something. There's a you know, there's an opponent processing. Well, I'm proposing. I'm not sure. 
is somehow going on here. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand what that means. And you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the numinous in this way. It's, it, it's fascinating in that it can pull us in, but it's terrifying because, so there's an organizational focus, right? But there's also the opening up of the, of the terror, of the horror. Yeah, yeah. Really struck, really, so, so the, the, I think one of the things that just got is, in some sense, Chris, this is what we were talking about, um, uh, in our last in our conversation that just actually I think it just aired, aired today um, mm. but this whole thing about how does the how does how does a mode become the place from which you reside what what is right what is how does one become enlightened and how does one become wise when those things by definition are if you say that you have them, you don't have them, right? There's mm -hmm. something about what you're talking about here that seems to get at, if we can understand how all of this comes together, right? And start to relate to it with more distinction. It seems like, it seems like it's almost like we're kind of back, we're backwards engineering enlightenment or something. Right. It's like it seems like enlightenment and in, in what is it to become deeply masterful at something. I just got the sense this time mm -hmm. as you that I've gotten before. Yeah. Well, well there's some resonance. Let me see. Um, so, so a model I have it, uh, an analogy and, and then I'll, I'll connect it up. So there's an analogy and Corey Lewis talks about this a former student of mine. Uh, laws rule out and models rule in um the laws say what can't come in and that's like your selective constraints and then the models uh, give you but these are all the things these are all the things that should be included they rule and of course the, and the thing is laws tend to be very limiting like narrowing and models tend to be multi-aspectual you can pick up on different uh different models uh, of the same thing and i'm trying to get that sense that the the uh, the the idos is something is ruling out so we can't just do anything right yeah okay. right uh, yeah. but but there's also an aspect of ruling in right but it's yeah. and, and i'm trying to figure out and then where that connects to what you just said is i i take it that that's what aristotle understood of virtue to be Right. So what you do mm -hmm. is you set up a select, you set up selective habits and enabling habits. Mm -hmm. The enabling habits prevent um, vices of deficiency, and the selective mm -hmm. habits prevent vices of excess. The golden mm -hmm. mean is not an average. The golden mean is the fact that the cycle of development is constantly being being guided between these two. Th it's it's being virtually engineered. So mm -hmm. I, I argue there's a deep connection between virtual engineering and Uraro's sense. And virtue and then virtual engineering lines up with this this sort of like ruling in and ruling out the right the the you, you want something that prevents excess semantic drift or whatever we want to call it i'm doing an umberto echo but something like that but we also we want something that doesn't impoverish uh the the richness of the reality of the thing <sighs> Sorry, I'm really struggling here, gentlemen, but I'm trying. That's why we're doing this. I'm really trying to get it. Yeah, lots of, lots of this, lots of things. It's, yeah. it's like how you can't do, you can't, if you jam and you don't know how to do music, you just get junk. You can only do jazz, right, like when you get this sweet spot between the constraints and the improvisation, right? It's, it's the same kind of thing over and over again, which isn't a coincidence. Mm. Yeah. So let's maybe bring in a few terms that seem to be orbiting around this that we've discussed before, but let's bring them into the center. They might be helpful. So, uh, so you're talking about the tension, if I've understood you correctly, that's a big if, but if I've understood you correctly, you're talking about, you're talking about the tension between yeah. the, the exact specificity of the aspectualization that 
invites a particular form of participation, such as the cicada drilling yeah. into the stem, right, of the rose. Yeah. And then you're talking about the kind of infinitization of that which is the object of participation that can take on multi-aspectual forms of life, depending on the vantage, the perspectival vantage of approach, right? So right. the cicada on the one hand, and then me on the other hand, as I pluck the rose and put, put it into a glass jar. Okay. But, but, but so, Chris, I want to add in a third dimension. See that? Okay. I, I want, I'm trying to get Schindler's for itselfness, the canadus. There's the structural form. There's a, the, the, it, has a, it has a for itselfness that, yeah, yeah. It, right, that has to be taken into account in both of those. That's what I'm... Right. Okay. Okay. So there's a continuity of identity. There's a continuity of identity between the suchness. That's what I want to bring in, suchness yeah. and the moreness, because they're yeah. speaking in those terms without using those terms, yeah. to my yeah, mind, yeah. right? Yeah. So the suchness of the aspect that seems to be, seems as the object of participation, right? We were using that term a lot the other day, Guy. Yeah. The seeming, the seeming yeah. of the aspect, right? And then the moreness, that kind of, that potential, that kind of, um, that kind of infinite reference, that infinite extension of aspect into multiple possibilities that, that yes. aren't delimited in any which way whatsoever. And so there's a continuity between them, between the yeah. suchness and specificity of the structural functional organization and its presentation. And then the infinite aspect that is the kind of, potential to take on any aspect depending on the particular perspective of participation. Is that fair so far? Yep. It's good. Okay. Okay. So, so that, that, so that it's, it's a kind of a classic dialectic tension by the sounds of it. And then the question is, what is it that binds that continuity of identity between the aspect, any one aspect and the infinite number of aspects and what binds them into coherence. And so my question is, what is the difference? Because when you talk about structural functional organization, that's one way of often, it's one way you often describe and define the logos. Yes, okay. that's right. Okay, so then what, let's maybe start here. What is the difference? This is a big question, I know. It's not like you're going to just have an answer ready. Or maybe you are. <laughs> but what is the difference between the logos as, it's, as we tend to define it? We tend to define it as something like that, like the structural functional organization yeah. and presentation of that which is. Yeah. How does that differ by definition from the IDOS that is somehow at the center the centerless center of the tension between the such of the aspect and the more of the infinite number of aspects. What is the difference between those two ideas? Here's the difference, I think. Um, the, the first is the for itselfness of the thing that Schindler emphasizes, right? The other is its inherent relationality and, and what Nishitani would call the circumessentiality of everything. Right, so there's two there's two ways in which we disclose the reality of a thing. One is right, like 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 you know the idea that so when I'm doing the aspectualization, I'm doing all the ways, all the 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 properties. All these words are a little bit inadequate, but all the properties that are disclosed in relation to other things, whereas the logos is supposed to be something that that's why I was invoking Spinoza's Canadus. It's a fundamental, the, the way the thing relates to itself. Um, right. Um, and, 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 the way the thing relates to itself. Yes. Right. Okay. I, I understand logos is the self-organizing property. Uh, right. And then the eidetic, the eidetic induction discloses that that self-rolling wheel Right is is moving through a multi-dimensional space uh, that discloses all kinds of properties of it that aren't disclosed just by its own self-organization. Sorry, again, struggling, but and and I think Plato, 
because th this was sparked by a conversation I had with you, Chris. You know, you said, well, isn't that notion of the good and isn't uh, the for isn't this aren't they the same? And I'm trying to get, yeah, but how? Like you said it intuitively, but it's like yes, but how? Right? That's what I'm trying to get at. I'm trying to get at, right? Yeah, what we're trying to do, and and th and, 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 and your language is right. There's a sense in which the for itselfness is an ultimate non-categorical suchness of the thing. The way it is, its suchness is, is a, is a non-categorical self-organization for itselfness, right? Mm -hmm. the, with the intrinsic nature, as, uh, uh, as Russell might call it, right? So then is the one way of thinking, so based on that, is one way of thinking about the logos a term for the self-relation of the IDOS? Yeah, I, I, I think it is. It's, uh, it, 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 that's, a, and I don't think I'm alone in this. I think that's how Kerrigan argues, uh, no, Kevin Corrigan, I should say, argues Plotinus thinks of logos. It's, it's a, so, right, that's why I, I shifted to Spinoza's sense of the Canadas, right? The, 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 the self-organization, self-preservation, sort of the way in which we extend metaphors of life to inanimate things. Mm. Mm. Right. Okay. But, that but, but of, right. That, so that's that. But then you have, you have Nishitani, but Plato has that. And Plotinus brings it out. You, you have the Indra's net, you have the multi aspectuality, you have the through, like you have the through line that is disclosed in eidetic eduction. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Is it kind of like with the, we'll say that we'll have the dance of the logos, right? Um, in a relation with itself. And as, as logos brings more and more things together, how, how do we know when Eidos, the, the through line starts opening up? But I don't like, think it goes sequential like that. That's the thing. Right. I, I, yeah, like I, axes. Yeah, that's what yeah, that's, metaphor and, and analogically speak, right? They're yes, almost yes, like yes, 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 dimensions, yes. axes of the same fundamental, different axes describing the same realness. Yeah. Right. And, and Chris, you're exactly right to map these two things, I think, onto the suchness and the moreness. The eidetic induction oh. discloses the moreness, but as I like to say, the moreness is both induced and edifying. It's it's not a it 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 it's it has a, it has a structural integrity, but it's not the right. same structural integrity as the canadus of the thing. Right, right, right. They're mm. somehow, but they, are, but they are not in any way separable from each other. Mm. Right. Here's a strange question: Does <laughs> yeah. does when you were you were this? I, I keep in my head. I have this beautiful image that you you spun of the cicada on the stem and yeah. um as being an aspect an aspect that participates in the idos of that stem that stem being not its material description but that being that which that in virtue of which it is what it is it's it's it, it, it is an attempt to understand the full panorama of its actuality all the way it can act and interact Right. Okay. And the it so, is, what's the it? The, 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 the IDOS, right? The okay, IDOS. Line, right? Yeah. Does, so does the, huh. hmm. so, okay, this, just as an idea. So the cicada in that, in that motif, the cicada seems to be in that when it's burrowing into the stem, seems to become a function of the idos's relatedness to itself. In other words, its relatedness to itself is something in which the cicada participates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is the cicada's participation necessary for the idos to relate to itself? Is its relatedness reflected by the participation of the cicada? And is the cicada's participation necessary to reflect that relation? And how does the log, if so, how does the logos figure back into that relationship? Okay. 
So first of all, the, the first part is yes, because the, 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 one of the functions of the IDOS is to bring sense to appearance and show how appearance can disclose reality. And there can only be appearance of uh, appearance to, right? Uh, like, uh, and so the first I think is yes, because that is one of the central functions that Plato tasks the IDOS with doing. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, what that? How does that relate to the logos? Is to re-ask the question that I'm asking, mm -hmm. which is how does that management of all the appearance, all the aspects, and remember, extended through perspectives, right, and extended through I, I imaginal trans-specific, right, consciousnesses or whatever verb we want to put, or whatever noun we want to put in there. I, I, it's not important to me right now, right. Mm -hmm. Like, how does that management of appearance, which is, which hangs on the bow, hangs on the border between an epistemic and an ontological function, relate to the for itselfness that gives something a reality independent from all the ways in which I can conceive of it, or, right, or or experience it. Because that's one of the functions, right? That Schindler talks about, uh, right? That the thing that things have a for a for themselveness that guarantees that they cannot be consumed into our subjectivity, right? Right, right. And you're asking, what is it that? I, I, what? So now, Chris has been very helpful. What binds the logos of suchness? to the melody of eidetic deduction. Hmm. That's what I was proposing about there seems, the suchness seems to be a, a, a limiting, right? It, it's ruling out a bunch of things, right? And then the moreness is a ruling in, but the, the, the suchness is saying, don't include this, 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 right? Yeah. Uh, and then the moreness is saying, include this, include this, include this, include this, include this, include this. Sorry, I'm just I'm just doing hand puppetry, but I'm trying to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, try, I'm tough, trying. It's tough. Yeah. Hmm. Because because think about how transformation requires both of these. This is almost a Kierkegaardian point. This is where Socrates and Kierkegaard really come together, right? Because right, right. if I if I can't do this, right, then it becomes just something that I have consumed, right. Right. But if I can't bring it into my suchness, it does not become a proper part of who and what I am as a self. Right. Yeah. 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 Totally. So then maybe, okay, so that's interesting. So then maybe one way of coming at this question what is it that binds this multi aspectualization of IDOS? to the for itselfness of the logos and how does one attain to the other? Yeah. And, so and, and maybe one way of coming at that question is to think about the, the appearances that host the forms of participation, mm -hmm. the cicada being the first yeah. example, but then there's a qualitative difference, a very fundamental qualitative difference between the way in which the cicada participates in the IDOS and the way in which the discerning human being, the self, yeah. participates in the IDOS. And so maybe one way of approaching the question of, well, what is it that binds these dimensions into their originary oneness and maybe the answer to that question has something to do with the facility of consciousness brought to bear in the matter of spirit and maybe that leads us back to socrates and certainly to kierkegaard hmm that's a good proposal okay let me feel about that i just i i just i i i like um so let, let let's just abbreviate we're what, what's we're asking what's the relationship between the logos and the through line uh, okay uh, so now we've we've gone all the preamble we got it down and so chris i want to understand more more clearly so you're saying 
right we bear we bear a different relationship to that and we are the being uh, heidegger we are the being who be whose being is in question and that makes us fundamentally open mm -hmm. to both of these in a way in which the cicada is not is that yes. a fair way of putting it that is okay. and okay. i oh, go, go i ahead. would add i would add just one more um one more uh um I don't know what it is. Is it, a, is it an analogy? Let's call it an analogy, which might help to state what I mean. I, I'm particularly um, taken, I, 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 in what, what way, I'm not even quite sure, but I'm particularly taken with the Jungian idea that, again, this is an, this is an analogy for the moment. Sure. I'm particularly taken with this idea that, that God requires the reflective consciousness of man to know himself. Yeah, I find yeah. that's a that's a astonishingly powerful and heretical powerful idea, and so I mean something along those lines in this proposal, which is that the binding, this sort of um, this the, this 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 the, the that the proper relation, as it may be between the logos and the through line is made whole by the, by the reflective participation of that form of attention that is brought to bear upon it. And that the training of attention in service of that reflection doesn't just serve the character of the individual who's undergoing the transformation, but is ultimately in service to the good itself in, yes. in the same kind of way. I, I, this is very loose. Like I'm just kind no, of no, throwing. No, no, no. You know. Don't, don't, don't misread my affect or anything. I, I, I'm, I'm being provoked in thought. Um, okay, for Would me, you... there's more than an analogy there. You're, you're situating the, the problem I've yeah. raised in another problem that's also at the core. But I think okay, that's okay. a valuable thing to do. Let me explain why. Okay, so you, you, you have, you have it within Neoplatonism that. To, right, you have the the procession. The you have the what I call the two symmetrical problems. The the problem of emergence is how do the normative whole? Where do the normative holes come from, and why are they ordered? Right, right. Well, there must be more uh, right, the platonic right. form. But the the problem facing right emanation is why does the one ever divide, and how could it possibly divide and differentiate? Right, and you need. And, and you see Dionysus wrestling with this. There has to be some sort of principle of receptivity that explains the attenuation of the emanation and right the possibility for variation. And where the hell is that in the one? Where can that possibly? And so I've been trying to propose, sort of inspired by Whitehead, the equal primordiality of the emergence and the emanation, right? right. But to me, that... Okay, and, 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 and to, to me, that's the ontological aspect of what you were explaining existentially, which is because cognition and intelligibility do the same thing. But mm -hmm. so there's a way in which you can think of everything gathering to a single self affirming logos, that's the one, but everything also emanates into all <laughs> the variations, like everything is just a is is just the multi aspectuality of the one uh, that that's another way of understanding neoplatonism right 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 and so then those multi those 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 the 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 uh, illusory discreteness the the separateness yes. of elements the separateness of things that have processed from the one their relatedness to one another is their relatedness back to it right yes. in that sense yes yes what, what 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 i've seen you doing though correct me if i'm wrong i've seen you saying you know the relationship between the suchness of the logos and the moreness of the through line that's actually also that's the relationship of emergence and emanation yeah 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 exactly yeah okay that's powerful yeah yeah and I think it's um, one of the things I'm appreciating about this so far is I can hear the sense, the sense in which 
accounting for the way that the like the one right and the particular and the many right are here in every moment right there's like not two worlds right oh and, no and no like, definitely yeah. not not doing that i'm not doing that yes and i can kind of feel i can feel the sense of i don't know the character of dynamism of this right that's one of the things that probably makes it so tricky to talk about. It's so, it's so dynamic. But I, what I'm hearing is this, um, an echo of this quality of um, something withdrawing, right? Something withdrawing yeah. and, and in that withdrawing opening, right? Uh, creating like an open, an, 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 open, an open ground for things to kind of gather together, right? But that, yeah. that's, whatever that is, that's withdrawing, you know, we can say maybe, maybe like the be, the being, being in its, being itself, not, not the being of beings, but being itself kind of in some sense withdrawals, withdrawals itself, thereby giving, giving a groundless, a groundless open, open place for the world to start occurring i'm just kind of getting the sense of there's this withdrawal structure right there's, there's withdrawal but there's also shaping See, yeah so it's not just the room it's not withdrawal in the sense of removal it's result it's it's like if you can yeah. combine withdrawal with affordance or virtual engine that that's what i was trying to get at the the withdrawal is also a virtual engineering so that the panorama yeah. of of actuality of how things can act and interact is is set out like the furniture yeah. of the universe is disposed <laughs> uh, With, right. a withdrawal of one into many in some sense yeah and, and, and that that goes towards the first point you made guy which is the, the i think the two worlds mythology when it pass from mythology into metaphysical dogma is a misapprehension of what we're talking about here it's yeah. a misapprehension yeah. it, and yeah. for me i would give it as an example of collapsing everything into just a structural functional organization mm -hmm. and leaving out right it's it's just the logos of intelligibility and not enough of the the the, the through line of intelligibility because all you've got is oh, what we have is reality is organized this way. Here's its structure, and here how this is how the structure is organized, and here is how it's functioned. But it's like no, no, no. That is that is losing everything we're talking about when we're talking about the through line, and it's losing the question of how is the through line related to the logos as a verb, to the legine, to the gathering together, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the problem, the problem is the melody is not free of logos because the melody is also the melody of the eidetic eduction also has a logos to it, right? It gathers to itself, right? So, yeah. uh, ah. <laughs> so then, to, to, so then, to what degree? Okay, so in each instance, let's say each instance of participation in the eidos, in the care of a single perspective, in a single scenario, in a single case, describe yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in each case of participation, there is a relatedness. There is a relation of the individual, let's say, to um, there is a relation of the individual at some point as if it could be mapped. It couldn't, yeah, but as if yeah, it could yeah. be mapped along that through line. Yes. There is a relation of the individual to the IDOS at some point along that through line. But yeah. at the same time as there is a relation from the individual to the IDOS, there is a relatedness to himself that is attained in virtue of the relation to the IDOS, right? So there's the relation out, and then there's something recursive about that relation. There would seem to be, right? Because how can you, because every instance of relating yeah, to no, no, something right. else is also an instance of relating to oneself. And this is sort of a Kantian point given a, a, a platonic twist. The yeah, subject, yeah, sort of the transcendental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The subject has to be bound, be able to bind to themselves to fall to track the through line uh, uh, of the multi aspectuality. But 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 the 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 thing being perceived also has to have something corresponding to right. it. Not it has to 
like, and I don't mean corresponding in the representational sense, I mean in the conformity sense, there has to be something in the object that is also binding itself together so that the eidetic, yeah. right? Right, so the right. eidetic deduction. Right, right, so then, there's a, so then there's a sameness, there's an identity relation there, right? That the binding of oneself as the participant, the binding to oneself and the being bound to oneself as the participant is also somehow the, is also somehow the, 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 the self-binding of that which is the object of participation. Right, right. And then what you said before, so fit that, what you said before into that, those two self-bindings are also like the poles of the resonance of the eidetic eduction. Right, right. As, as above, so below, as it were. Yes, yes. So, right, so when, when like, you know, when, when, when the artist is unpacking the, the multi-aspectuality of the tree and showing you how all these appearances disclose something that could be numinous to you. And you're getting, oh my gosh, the through line through inexhaustible connectivity. You are also being connected in a, this is the anagogic aspect. You are being connected. And then in that connection, you also sense the, the, the for itselfness of the right. thing. Right, right, yeah. right. You're being connected to yourself through the tree, and the tree is being connected to itself through you in some sense. Right, right. But the, but the, but there's also a you connected to yourself and a tree connected to it. Right, right, right. So it's if it, it, it's like these two spinning wheels, and then they're spinning the the cycle of anagoge between them, and that is actually also tracing out the multi aspectuality of the thing and also of you. Right. Right into a into a kind of multivalent reciprocal opening or something yes. like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But what? And I, then when go it ahead. Spins, the reciprocal spins fast enough where it just you, you the all, all the movement just becomes one. Like this is where I think this is where it goes from from dialectic into into dialogos is that when. When all of that's happening, this reciprocal opening that's going yeah. on at some point, it, then it happens between us, around us, right? Like, and at yeah. some point, all that movement just becomes one shape, right? That's yeah. that. Yeah. That's yeah. that thing where it's it become you become kind of there, like there's an identification with logos, right. or or idos, and and, it, and and then it becomes into the verbal mode. Yes. Right. Yep. Yes. Yes, the verbal and the adverbial. Yeah. Yes, and, and so I think that's right. What you just said, guy, and I, th and so that 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 goes to the point. The point of the, all of this, what sounds like abstract stuff, actually is a way of trying to articulate what is a very very powerful transformative experience in which people yeah. discover kinds of ways of connecting to themselves to each other and to sense-making itself that then somehow makes them discover possibilities of being that are now actualizable to them instead of just being conceptual labels. Like, so, you know, people, uh, I'm, I discovered a kind of intimacy with myself and with other people and then with, with the world and re that's how people talk, right? So th that's exactly right that, you know, everything we're talking about sort of metaphysically or whatever we're doing right it, it's not abstract that's exactly the point it's not it sounds theoretical but it's actually trying to it's we're trying to point to what must being be like such that it can support dialectic into dialogos so powerfully i mean that's another way of putting the question that i'm asking can you consider that again what might what what you must be what? like such that it could support this, right? What I'm experiencing. So in, the, in Dialogos, so Dialogos is to discover the dynamic through line, but also to feel, right, the, the, the polarity of the selfness of me and of the other and of the world, right? It's, it's everything. It's, it's, it's the dynamic discovery and disclosure of everything we've been talking about. Yes? Right, right. Yes. Yes. Right. And, but, but what I want to try and do is say, okay, so we talk about theoria to, to theory. We've got the theoria where we're engaged in the dialectic into dialogus and we're getting all of this. 
And then I want to go back and say, well, is there theory within the platonic corpus? And by theory, I don't just mean proposition. I mean, all this non-propositional stuff we're trying to point at, right? All this perspectival and participatory, but is there theory that can properly articulate this? Hmm. And you, the, many people will say, but I don't need the theory. But the problem is if you don't have a theory, in the, yeah. in the sense we're talking about here, you don't, you can't situate this practice within an encompassing worldview, and then yeah. we're doomed. Then we're doomed. This yeah. just becomes another self-enclosed thing that people do that doesn't really connect to the needed transformation of the worldview in order to address the meaning crisis. That's that's my concern. Yeah. 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 So your, your first instinct, when you started to talk about Plato, right at the beginning, you were talking about third wave uh, Platonism, Plat uh, uh, Platonic scholarship, that is, uh, people like Gonzalez, etc. And so how, so the question of where can we find the theory to support a way of being or a way of realizing being that can sustain such transformation in the care of Dialogos? Right, right. Go ahead. And, and and so one of the first things that you started on was about Plato's role not only as a uh, purveyor of propositions but as a dramatist. Yes. Yes. And yes. and and that I that's so mm -hmm. key. It's so key in ways that are so mysterious because it has to me that that it's very very because of the complexity of those dialogues. It's difficult to to. Something about the relation, the tension, the re the relationship with, and sometimes it's a it's a it's a very juxtaposing relationship between the propositions that are being traded between Socrates and his interlocutors, and the dramatic context in which the dialogue is seated, yes, yes. and how changes in the dramatic context also change the valence of the propositions by changing the implicature. Right, yeah. the pragmatics of those propositions, where oh. they're directed, where they're oriented, and all of that, and and we know from experience of doing dialogos that the relationality, the, the intimate context, has everything to do with d d establishing the pragmatics into which the propositions will be entered. Beautiful, beautiful. And so there's something. Let's go back to that if we can, because there's something like you started on that at the very beginning, and there was something very right about that. So the place to look or to begin looking would, for that theory, for the theoria, would seem to be the relationship between the propositions the, and the pragmatics determined by the dramatic context and the symbolic mapping of the arena, right? Schindler talks about that at the very beginning, right? Yep, that Socrates yep, yep. goes down into the, yep, yep, yep. Um, uh, uh, is it into the, is it into the forum? Where, where is it? Where no, is no, it? he's going down to the name of that fortified port uh, that was connected to Athens. Uh, right. I forget what it's called, uh, but go ahead. In yeah. any case, but the way that the dialogue is spatialized, the way that the literally the way that the bodies move within the space, yes. the way that the arena is delimited, and the way that the propositions take place within that, right? There, there's a, there's a, there are dimensions, there are axes, there are there, there's a deep nested pattern going on in these dialogues, whether consciously rendered or not, it really doesn't matter as far as I'm concerned. It could well have been rendered unconsciously. It's genius is no less for it. Um, and But there's something about the patterns that are traced out by the dialogue, by the dramaturgy in addition to the spoken dialogue that creates the tension that somehow maps onto the tensions between the such and the more that we're trying to describe. Right. That, that's excellent. And so let's do the pragmatics, right? For, first of all, one of the things I'm trying to articulate, and I'm actually trying to get a relationship between theory and theoria, right? Um, an optimal grip, perhaps. So it's not itself a theory, it's an optimal grip between them uh, that what it can point to. But think about how, how pragmatics hangs between two non-propositional. There's the sense of the all everything I convey, and we know that the conveyance can never be captured in the proposition because it always is the mornest, right? Right. 
And so it, 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 it's, it, it, it weaves, it weaves, so the conveyance weaves us into the context and into the multi aspectuality and, and we play with that. We play with implicatures, all over, jokes are all about that. Oh, uh, you were focused on this aspect and that's the aspect I was talking about, right? Uh, don't leave alphabet soup on the stove because it could spell disaster, right? Stuff like that, where we play with it. We play, yeah, we trade between aspects, right? But there's also another, part of pragmatics, was it, which is indexicality, which is the direct demonstrative reference. This, this, I'm not, I'm not using a term like cat or dog. I'm, I'm doing salience tagging and, and, I, and then I'm doing something that makes you gather them together before any categorization can take place. So <laughs> pragmatics properly hangs between conveyance and indexicality, is that okay? And that's that, good. That's and that's one of Peirce's types of signs in this typology of signs is that the indexicality. Right. And, and, and there's a primordiality to the indexicality, but there's also a primordiality to conveyance because the 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 existence of the other requires conveyance. OK, so now I see the propositional as in between those. Mm. Right. And, and so the propositional is held in the tension between the suchness of indexicality, thisness, suchness, here nowness, right? And right, the and the moreness of all of the things I I'm conveying beyond what I could possibly say. Hmm. The proposition. So the proposition is actually inherently metaxu. It's inherently bound and held between those. And it only gets its stability. We think of the stability as its relationship to other propositions, but its stability is properly between the indexicality and the conveyance. In other words, by analogy, the single proposition in this context is like the single shaft of light that cordons an arena of dark, right? We were taught, when we talk about dialogos, we talk about the effect of light Yes. upon the dark that it's revelatory for the dark yes. and yes. so the proposition in this case serves something similar in its function which is that it creates it creates a provisional boundary in which the moreness is suddenly imminent enough to be experienced because it has somehow delimited its territory something it, like that yeah, yes it's like the proposition is located in the space of the question we're asking, although the proposition cannot offer the answer. The proposition mm -hmm. is held in the space between the logos of suchness and the through line of moreness, and yet yeah. the proposition can't. The proposition depends on this, but it can't disclose it. There's an absolute asymmetrical dependence right. of the proposition on that place, but it can't actually disclose the place. Right. So the, oh, and so if you, if you, sorry, guy, go ahead, go ahead. I've talked enough. Well, and I'm just going to say that, and I get the sense that they can't disclose it is actually a drawing in towards it. Right. Yes. Right. So it, it's like, it can't yeah. disclose it, but, but it, it's, it, it's, it's like, but it's, in not disclosing it, it discloses it. it, 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 it I want to invent a term here. In not disclosing it, it nevertheless sort of undiscloses or uncovers its place yeah. within the tension. Right. Yes, 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 yes. Right. So That's language, it's not, it's not the content of the language, but the fact it's that- It's negative. Language, yeah, yes, it's the negative space. It's negative. Somehow. Yeah, yes, yes. It has no positive content. It, it's, it's function- in the dialogical process is not to introduce any positive content, it's create the negative space. Yes, I think yeah. that is exactly right. Which and, makes and perfect that, sense. Right, and that's, and, and, and the moment of aporia is when you shift off of, right, off of the content of the proposition to the placement of it within that tension between indexicality and conveyance or between suchness and moreness. In other oh. words, you, it's the transparency opacity shift that you begin to know through the proposition. Yes, but not the, not the typical representational transparency. Hmm. Right? It's not the referent of the proposition. It's the existent. It's the it's the dynamic instantiation of the proposition as a proposition that right affords the hmm. possibility of recognizing its place 
between the indexicality and the mm. conveyance. And, mm. and, and, and Wittgenstein was, and I think this is where Wittgenstein and Heidegger come together. Wittgenstein was constantly trying to get people to look, stop, right? And people think, oh, without which I cannot speak, I must remain silent. He doesn't mean passivity. He means a deep, deep looking, a deep seeing that can't be captured by the speaking, right? Because you, we get locked into the picture of the proposition and we forget the forms of life and language game that it's situated within. Right, yeah. right, right. So even if a lion could talk, we would not understand him. Totally, in the, in the appear, so this non-apparent harmony that is disclosed through this. Yes. Um, It's it. I guess the question the, the question that's there for me is what something about the development of character and the way that this shapes one's face. How you can look at somebody's face and they can have a wise face, right? Mm. There's this. There's um. There's um. I'm wondering if one of the ways that the 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 non-appearing harmony appears is actually in the interlock in interlocutors the, the face the 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 one of the ways it distributes itself and 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 shows itself is in these i don't know that's just that sense of like no i think there's something there i think there's something there and it's yeah. this the, it's the it's the stegmeier stuff right face yeah. is orientation mm. and what we're talking about is the, the orienting that happens around language such that the proposition can speak to us right and yep. and that would show up in someone's face because a face is where we look to try and get clues onto how someone is orienting physically but of course they're also orienting metaphysically yeah it's the where from guy it's the where from we were talking about the other day and this is like this is also this is where the drama comes in, like the 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 that that in some sense the as the like in mu in music the you know you get these musical motifs right that um, that get established and you know they're established because they repeat they're repetitive, and then like a sonnet is something like the song is the is the is the development of 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 those motifs, but that's analogous to character, right? Mm -hmm. That yes. there's a there's a there's a drama going on that we're under that we're undertaking, right? That's 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 happening through this as well, right? One of the, the ways that it all comes in and configures itself, right? Because um, I've been noticing that too, that you know the way that Schindler continually like shows one of the places meeting happens in the in the dialogue that i i wouldn't i wasn't even seeing right and making all of all of these connections and the dramas and the tensions convey as much of the meaning right um as the actual explicit accounts of things right and so there's something about there's something about um care like something about character and the development of how how the how these kinds of dramas de develop character right mm -hmm. in some sense well well, well the, the the drama is there as the perpetual anamnesis of conveyance right the point of drama is to re remind us that there's always a conveyance beyond what is being said right yeah. and so yeah. but the, the, the character, to my mind, goes back to what, what Chris and I were talking about when we were talking about, right, there's a through line of the self that is somehow bound up with the self-relation of the self. So, right, uh, the, the, the for itselfness and the for the other, if I can put it that way, are, are interwoven. We, we talked about that earlier. Um, and, and, and so I think that 
and, and in that way, you can even talk about the character of a thing, its characterization, mm -hmm. uh, where you're trying to get in drama and, and, and discourse, you're trying to get how the things for itselfness and how its through line are wedded together somehow. Because um, a good characterization, even of an inanimate thing in literature, right, tries to, well, it tries to situate the words between the indexicality and the conveyance. And it's, and what, you, and, and you're trying to find, there, there's some non-logical, even non-phenomenal, it's not non-phenomenal, not non Nomological, but there's it's non-logical identity between the logos and the through oh, line. We keep yes. we saying how they keep are like this, and, and it's like, and, and the indexicality and the conveyance are bound together. That's how they can right. They're, they're, they they can create the field. The, the, I'm almost almost thinking of it like a magnetic field that holds the proposition in place, orients the proposition so it can be properly processed. And so the entire world around it can be bound into coherence. Yes. Right. Coextensively with it. Cause that's the thing about character too, is that character, there is no, like, it's interesting, right? When we think about character in sort of a literary way or a, or a theatrical way, character, we, we think of character as, as a form of an individual, but what character really is, is an, is the entire kind of orchestral backdrop that corresponds to the individual, right? The individual yeah. comes ready-made with an entire cosmos and the individual is at the center of that cosmos. And the kind of, um, the kind yeah. of cosmic geography that situates around that individual is coextensive with the character. It's, it's, it's what we mean by, right? You can't think of Oedipus without, think of the entire, without thinking of the entire, uh, um, um, without thinking of the entire narrative apparatus that surrounds him and binds him unto himself, right? Yeah, he yeah. relates to himself by means of the cosmos that comes with his character and they're inseparable from one another, right? Any great famous character, the same could be true. It's Faust, it's, it's Macbeth, what, whatnot. They come with an entire cosmos in care of which they are bound to themselves and which is bound to them. And so in some sense, it's like the, the character is like the for itselfness, the logos, the for itselfness that's embedded in the pragmatic context of one aspect of participation in some sense. That's good. I was thinking when you invoked Oedipus of the character chorus connection, the, the yeah. connection between the character and the chorus, right? Um, and the chorus is always supposed to the moreness. Yeah, the moreness and, and dance beyond what is actually being said, right? The, the chorus often points to, I bet you didn't realize that this right, is- a, Right, right. Nietzsche right? makes that point, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Dionysian and the Apollonian right. in, the, in the spirit of tragedy, exactly. Um, but, and this is right. I, and I, 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 I and, and, and that idea of, like the emer the emergence up from the indexicality and the, and the emanation down from the conveyance and the proposition as somehow mediating that and like yeah. that's all that's all that's all good and I think it's important and, and like we're getting orientation we're right yeah yeah but I I still maybe maybe yeah. there isn't a concept for this I mean well, I, I, I'm trying to get at how right how they are one <laughs> how what how what are one how the logos of suchness and the melody the through line of moreness are one we, we we're, we're stipulating that they are somehow oneing they are mm -hmm. bound they interpenetrate with emergence and emanation they create a, a, a field with polarity that orients the propositions so that they are oriented this way or placed this way mm -hmm. rather than placed this way or this way. I'm using spatial metaphors here, right? And, you know, and, and this is, you know, the forms of life and all that, uh, all that, the language game that isn't itself a language, right? Um, all that stuff. But I, I, like Plato seems to think, is it just that he didn't think enough? I don't know. Plato seems to talk easily and readily 
uh, as if these aspects are the same. Like they're, they're, they're somehow, there's one form, they're, right? You know what I, I'm trying to get at, the, uh, right? The, and it, it's- In the good, like, like it's the good, the one. No, I'm not, not even that. I, I mean, that's, 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 that's for me, that's about how all of this intelligibility mm -hmm. is always the promise that it will always disclose reality keeps being kept. That's what I think yeah. of as the good, but yeah, but I'm trying, I'm trying to get at like, you know, the, the form of justice is somehow mediating between the indexicality of this right here now and yep. the moreness of all of the different aspects of justice. Is it fairness? Is it appropriate distribution? Is it a, a, a way of connecting to the good life? Does it meet like, blah, right? So you've got all of that. And then you've also got, yeah, but what is it to be just right here, right now? The form is somehow mediating between, but, but it's not, uh, right? It's yeah. Plato, it's, it's doing that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mediating between that, all the appearances. It's mediating between yeah. all the appearances. Here's one way of putting it. That's the multi aspectuality But it's also, and I'm playing on the word appearance here, but it's also mediating between all the instances. Hmm. Plato was clear about that as well. Through all the instances. Yeah. Yeah. It's frustrating. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, we're right at the. We're right this at the This is okay. great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right at the edge. This is great. We're right at the edge of for that 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 um the name of that concept that that isn't yet. Yeah. Perhaps. Right. I, I, it's it's going to be it's going to be it's going to be weird. It's going to hang between a concept, a state of mind, um, a form of interaction. I, it's it's a concept, yeah. but also optimal gripping, and also perspective shaping, and also uh, action uh, 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 organizing. Like it's uh... and it's so it's so <laughs> it's so arresting because it's that it's that in virtue of which the instance is real and felt as real right totally. totally otherwise otherwise we become we otherwise we just fall back into a form of nominalism right like if the if the instance of justice is not being mediated with its corresponding form then it is not felt as just it's not felt as real right and and that intuition is so that intuition is so is so powerfully arresting that it's it's impossible to ignore and yet yeah accounting for it accounting for it is so bloody difficult and, and i don't think this is isolated to just philosophical talk if you think oh, yeah. about it if you think about it relativity is emphasizing the inherent relatedness and how everything aspectualizes everything else right and, and quantum is no no here's the absolute indexicality of reality and and then and then the what there's like but how do they go together it, which is yes that's just another instance within physics of the same thing but it's just it, that problem in physics is not fundamentally different from every other thing within our phenomenological experience it's a fundamental tension within intelligibility and the and how it discloses being that we're we're, we're bumping up against here. Yeah, and what and wonder if we're trying to look at the sun. We are like remember like yeah because remember there's that thing the one of the dialogues right the where, republic the republic you can't look at the sun he does a retrospective like a retrospective where he's like. I remember when I first started to like look for knowledge of natural or causes of natural of natural things, and he realized that he hit some ceiling. But he knew that if he if he looked for the cause, the the cause of all causes, that he'd burn, he'd go blind. So he <laughs> right. Yeah. So this is it's a the, like this is his retrospective. Um, I think 
I think he's saying this in context, in, in terms of context of giving what, why are we talking about things like an account, um, the, the logos of something, this, the, and not just, uh, yeah, yes, yes. I'm wondering, I, I'm wondering if this is what we're kind of, I think it is. I think, I think it's yeah. exactly that. I think it's the pragmatics, the pragmatics of the musicality of intelligibility that we're wrestling with here. And then, yeah. Right. And, and, and what, what, what is, I think you're right. We might be trying to look at the sun. Um, mm -hmm. And then, then I wonder if, right. I mean, the, the interesting thing about mystical experiences is those, po those poles are some, I mean, I'm thinking of Kuza and the coincidence of opposites, right. And that the, 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 somehow there's an experience in which the polarity actually becomes a stereoscopic through yeah, which yeah. something, right? That's but you, there's no way of articulating it. There's no way of articulating. Yeah. It. Doesn't 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 um, doesn't Ponte, uh, Marcel Ponte talk about this this thing about? I think you you put it. Maybe you restated it. Um, where like we can have a what does he say? We can have. Oh, what was it? We can have. We can instantiate an appearance of ultimate reality, right? A real, uh, what was it? There is something about there is something about the way that you were talking about Marcel Ponte that accounted for this, um, this, this. I have a feeling we're going to be doing a lot of that in this. <laughs> yeah. This right. Yeah. This way, well, in some in some sense, it's the it's kind of the 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 frame problem, right? In some way, right? Um, there's there there was there was a John there was there and I think it was I think it was in the context of you talking about. Um, uh, the hermeneutics of beauty and the hermeneutics of um, suspicion, suspicion yeah. Right? right? So the, the yeah. yeah, and you were talking about, re and you, I think you had reread um, uh, the book that Ponty didn't finish. What is that called? The, no, no, um, uh, the, vi the visible and the invisible. No, Dan and I are about to read that, but we were reading Lowe's book on his attempt to finish the argument that Marlo Ponty didn't finish in the invisible and the visible, or is it the visible and the invisible? I can never remember the order um, because he died. And Lowe's book, what, what, uh, yeah, and, I, and it, it was trying to connect, right? What happened when you try to think this thought? He died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You stare too long into the abyss. Yeah. Um, there, yeah, there, there, I think there's something right about that. And, and um, Scari talks about that, about uh, how beauty does that weird thing. Uh, beauty discloses the panorama. Like, like she says, you see the beautiful tree and you, you said, I couldn't, I didn't, I never realized that trees could be like this. And so the eidetic adduction opens up, the eidetic adduction and edification opens up. But then it's also yeah. this particular tree, the particularity yeah. and the uniqueness also shine forth because how is it that this is embodying all of that? right totally. um and she says beauty is the experience of that kind of polarity it's it's the, it's the i'm absolutely i'm bound to this here now because mm -hmm. right, i'm bound to its suchness because that suchness is the locus through which i'm suddenly realizing right it's it's like all the trees are in the tree but that 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 doesn't just make this tree a, another member it makes it a specifically unique disclosure again the language is just i'm just fumbling around and yeah and 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 i think that's right that's what beauty is and that's the way in which we 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 can discern the orientation the orientation of appearance to reality in the hermeneutics of beauty as as distinct from the hermeneutics of suspicion where what appearances do is they you know, they reorient us and displace us right rather than leading us into the depths of something Mm. so it, mm. it, you, you allow for that kind of that perspectival stereoscopy 
right? Yes, that yes, two yes. points, two points along that kind of unchartable through line can be used to triangulate the third. That third to which they both belong, but they both belong numinously, right? Yes, that third yes. being something un unaccountable. Yes, but yes. that the minute, the minute one becomes two, they both become three. Yes. Right? Because suddenly they're in relation to one another and they're in yes. relation to a third, right? The minute you add one person to two, there is immediately a third entity, right? Yes. Yes. And in the yes. same way, two instances, two encounters, two aspects immediately create between them what one one impregnates the other in some sense right if that yes. if that makes any sense they they call to each other but this is what we discover in dialectic and the dialogos two people call to each other from the depths and then they are called together to the depths right yeah yeah right. yeah so, chris do you see how this is the the depths of the leap, leap of reason and how it's sounding very similar to kierkegaard's leap of faith oh and, yeah yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Very, very much. The Socratic leap, right? The Socratic Neoplatonic leap and the leap of faith in Kierkegaard really, really are. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it happens, it happens in the assumption of the paradox, right? The assumption yeah. of the paradox of two dialectically sharing their identity and producing between them that, that um, extended reference whose pragmatic arena exceeds the bounds of those two yes yes that's well said that's very well said i propose that maybe we bring it to a close for today. yeah i'm going to listen to this a number of times <laughs> but this has been this this has been very helpful uh, yeah. a, a, a lot of things got clarified and there was a lot of good articulation and stabilization because i was feeling like I was feeling almost distraught because I was being, I'm trying to, like, I, I, I understand I won't be able to bring them in, into one sense of resolution, completeness, but I want to at least bring them into the other sense of resolution, with it, which is acuity, right? That I could, right? They're, they're, it's not all just this blur. Um, and again, what I liked is how this, so this often abstract thing kept feeding back into, but that's what's happening in dialectic to dialogos. That's what people are experiencing. They're experiencing all of this, not as abstract metaphysics. They're experiencing this as existential and personal transformation. Yeah. In fact, in fact, the proposition ends up being a, becomes a kind of a dwelling site of the ride that they just went on. Right. Yes, so they come yes. back to the proposition. They, you say it again. We started having a with the third person as a scribe because we yeah. have somebody who's just deducing, right? And then the other person who's who's actually listening and tracking the proposition. So every time they come back to the proposition, they realize that there's been a change, right? right. Because it's like, oh, well, I have good. to. That's good. That, right? that's good. That's that good. That's a good. Going back and forth has its sense of like where that proposition has this quality of 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 dwelling. You, you yeah. you're dwelled. Yeah in it and in well by it right it's just got this quality of home that's yeah. good because i've been trying to think of a way in which the other two people in in the foursome can act as a chorus for the interlocutor drama and that's a good way yeah. of doing it. that's excellent that's really good that's really good and it emerged out of the practice which is really good really good for yeah beautiful yeah and, and then when that happens incidentally we might say that both because of the way that it both of the way in which it brings both the suchness and moreness into more direct cor direct and lucid correspondence, uh, but also the way it becomes the kind of vehicle for the overall practice, it becomes properly symbolic, right? So in some sense, when dialectic turns into dialogos, what happens, I think, phenomenologically is that it symbolizes the propositions. Yes. The propositions... Yes. The propositions yeah. become symbolic vehicles. And that's why when we return to the proposition, we don't interact with them anymore as propositions. We act, we interact with them as symbolic affordances that pry open the space in which the practice takes place in the first place. Yeah. Right. As long as we understand symb symbol as symbol on the yes. joint together of the two, right? Yes. The intentionality and the conveyance, the logos and the melody of the through line, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, gentlemen. So good. Thank you so Thank much. You. All right.